It happens to be a, a big day in the history of the Corona program. It's the 50th anniversary of the first successful flight with cameras and film. So if we could just proceed down to Space Race, uh, right at the V2 rocket, take a left. It's against the uh, windows. We're standing in front of uh, the uh, last and most advanced camera used in the Corona program, which was America and the world's first successful photo reconnaissance satellite program. Uh, as a little bit of background, uh, the Air Force started uh, really a, a small scale R&D program in 1956, uh, Project WS-117L, to develop a photo reconnaissance satellite, uh, a signals intelligence satellite, and a satellite to give additional warning uh, or notice of enemy missile launches. And after Sputnik and all the uh, effects that uh, Sputnik had on U.S. government, U.S. society. Uh, that program was uh, greatly uh, uh, enlarged. And, but they were having a lot of problems in this all Air Force program developing photo reconnaissance satellite systems. They were looking at two possibilities. One was a film return. You send up a camera and film in space. After the film's exposed, you bring it back down to Earth, you process it, the analysts look at it. The other was a, a near real-time uh, film readout system where the imagery is returned uh, electronically to Earth. Uh, each had its advantages and disadvantages. With those problems, in early 1958, President Eisenhower split off the most promising uh, imagery intelligence system from the Air Force project and that was a film return system. It was far ahead of, of the readout system at that point. And he assigned it jointly to the Air Force and CIA. It was designated Corona. It was very highly classified. There were some leaks about the Air Force program, what they were trying to do. Uh, and so if you read the press from 57, 58, 59, 60, you'll see some references to the Air Force program. You won't see any references to this joint CIA Air Force uh, program. In any event, um, Lockheed, not Lockheed Martin at that time, but Lockheed Missiles in Space got the prime contract to develop the upper stage and they developed the Agena. Uh, which incidentally was used for many decades for both civilian and national security uh, payloads. Uh, General Electric got the uh, contract to develop the film return capsules and iTech in Massachusetts got the contract to uh, develop the cameras. And in early 1959, test launches started and one after another, uh, they failed for uh, reasons such as uh, launch vehicle blew up shortly after the liftoff at Vandenberg. Um, the the uh, Agena was put in a proper orbit, uh, but then when it came time to recover the film return capsule, uh, that ended up off the coast of Norway instead of the uh, planned uh, recovery area northwest of Hawaii, one problem after another. Uh, finally, with the actually 14th law, uh, launch in early August 1960, and it went by the uh, name of uh, Discover 13. Discover was um, a cover story that had been um, uh, disseminated by the national security agencies uh, to um, explain these launches, all of which occurred at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, up the coast uh, from Santa Barbara in California. Why Vandenberg? Because all these payloads were to go into uh, polar orbits. And so uh, with Discover 13 um, in early August 1960, which did not carry a camera or film, um, everything worked properly. 
and the uh, single film return capsule uh, separated from the satellite and uh, came down through the atmosphere as all these film return capsules did. About uh, 60,000 feet, it deployed parachutes. Uh, and the recovery area was a huge expanse of ocean, northwest of Hawaii, lots of Navy ships, lots of Air Force planes. Um, everything was designed that Air Force planes would snag the parachute, as depicted in this particular photograph, reel in the parachute in, in film return capsule. That didn't happen with Discover 13. It landed in the Pacific, but Navy ships uh, knew where uh, it was and they went and retrieved it. And that was the first object successfully recovered uh, from orbit. Um, the capsule was full of diagnostic equipment. Um, Discover 13 is over and looking at Earth uh, the, uh, with the parachute. Um, and and uh, it's, it's really a very historic object. So the Discover 13 capsule, the capsule covering the parachute are right across the way and looking at Earth. Uh, just a little over a week later, um, the authorities decided uh, they're going to try to orbit a camera and film again. They had done that in the 14 previous launches five or six times without any success whatsoever. The camera that was being used at that time, very early in the program, very, very different from this. As I mentioned earlier, this was the, mo uh, the last and most advanced camera used in the program. This was used a uh, little over 10 missions from 67 to 72. The very first camera, uh, this is designated the KH-4B, also has a designation J3. The very first camera used uh, in what was publicly disclosed is the Discover 14 mission, but uh, uh, behind closed doors was Mission 9009, was the C single prime camera, or the KH-1. It had a single uh, panoramic camera. The two panoramic cameras are these uh, uh, two large drums at an angle. It had a single pa a panoramic camera. It, oper it, it didn't rotate constantly, it swung back and forth. Um, the film load on this camera was 180 pounds. On those first missions, uh, unsuccessful and successful, it was 20 pounds. So the film supply cassette, which on this camera is at the aft end of all these optics, was in front of the single panoramic camera and then it only had a single film return capsule. This had two. So picture this uh, gold-plated film return capsule, all the reels inside um, being where this hardware is. It was a much, much smaller package. Uh, in any event, um, they launched it from Vandenberg. Uh, it, it reached the proper orbit. Um, at that time, uh, uh, the program was using the first generation of Agena upper stages developed by Lockheed, and that was the Agena A uh, for various reasons, including very, very limited power supplies. Uh, mission life at that time was uh, about 28, 36 hours maximum. This mission was 17 revolutions. Uh, of the Earth uh, a little over uh, 24 hours. Um, it made, uh, of course, the main target uh, at that time was the Sino-Soviet bloc, in particular the Soviet Union. Uh, how many missile complexes did they have, particularly intercontinental ballistic missiles? Where were they? Uh, where were their surface-to-air missiles? Where were all their military airfields? How many planes were there? How many hangars? Uh, U-2s, of course, had overflown the Soviet Union beginning in 1956. There were 24 successful missions until Gary Powers' plane was shot down in May 1960, just a couple months before the first successful Corona mission. Uh, altogether, those 24 successful missions had photographed about 15% of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and at a much higher resolution than Corona did. Uh, 
the best resolution, ground resolution, of the U-2 was about two feet along the flight path. Um, the figures I've read for the first generation of Corona cameras um, varies between 25 at the best to 35 at the best, which means, in, in simple terms, uh, how small can an object be on a side to be detected in a photograph? With U2, uh, two feet or larger, it could be detected by the analysts. With this, somewhere uh, between 20 and 35 feet on a side. Um, and again, that resolution was only under uh, the ideal circumstances along the flight path, because the frames were very large. The oblique angles of the camera, the resolution was much less. There had to be a good sun angle, uh, uh, no haze, smoke, clouds, uh, so on and so forth. Um, in any event, uh, the first successful Corona mission uh, brought back more imagery of the Soviet Union than all 24 successful U-2 overflights, although at a much poorer resolution. And um, unlike a, a pilot in the U-2, uh, this camera was programmed to operate at certain points during the mission, and um, the weather over the photographic targets um, couldn't be factored in the, uh, uh, in the programming. So well over half the photography from the first successful Corona mission, 18 August 1960, was cloud covered. They brought it to the then CIA Photographic Interpretation Center down in the Navy Yard. The following year, that became the National Photographic Interpretation Center. And um, a lot of it simply wasn't usable. It was just of cloud tops. And that was a, a, a major problem in the Corona program um, until uh, a classified weather satellite uh, became operational a couple years later. And then the amount of cloud-covered photography from the Corona program decreased dramatically. Um, we don't know what the government spent in total on the Corona program or on individual missions. All the budget figures are still classified uh, to this day. Um, I'm gonna hand out, just as a matter of interest, uh, the Corona program, the existence thereof, was declassified pursuant to an executive order President Clinton signed in 1995. Obviously, all the intelligence agencies had concurred in that decision before he signed the order. And um, that executive order declassified the existence of the program and all 800,000 images, 800,000 plus or minus images, taken from 18 August 1960 through May 1972, the date of the last mission. Um, and they put together a little uh, two, three hundred page monograph, some of the documents. This is an excerpt from that monograph of the index to targets from this very first mission. Um, the index itself is oh, well over a hundred pages. It's just interesting to, to take a look at this. And on the third or fourth, page of this excerpt, you'll see a map of the Soviet Union, and you'll see the swaths that, uh, uh, that were photographed. And it's, it's hard to read, but down on the lower left-hand side, there's like a, 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 a weather, kind of a, a, a weather chart. And in each swath, there's a number indicating uh, cloud uh, conditions. Um, obviously, this had to photograph in the daytime. Um, there was no, I mean, it could photograph at night, but you're not going to get any usable imagery at night. You may get some city lights, and that's about it. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this program continued on until uh, 1972 much, much longer than originally planned. 
Um, over the years, cameras were improved, the Agena was approved, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, by the late 1960s, the best resolution that this camera was achieving, again, ideal uh, conditions along the flight path, good sun angle, so on and so forth, was uh, objects six feet on a side. A, a great and dramatic improvement over the, the uh, early cameras. And also the duration of missions uh, was up to almost three weeks at the end of the program. And the programming advances, which are still a little murky today, it's, it's, a little, it's a little vague and ambiguous how they program the satellites and how they change the programs from the ground control stations. Um, but they, it, it, as years went on, uh, they were able to partially reprogram the satellites. So when a satellite was up in orbit, uh, if all of a sudden there was a um, development in the Middle East, uh, uh, some sort of uh, onset of war or, or something of that nature, uh, and, the, and the satellite wasn't programmed to cover it, it could be reprogrammed. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to stop there. There's lots more to talk about the program, but I'll stop there. I'd be happy to uh, try to answer any questions. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.